কি শুরু করবো এভরিবডি ইজ অনলাইন গুড আফটারনুন গুড আফটারনুন এভরিবডি আই হোপ ইউ আর বিং এবল টু সি অ্যান্ড হিয়ার মি উই হ্যাড সাম ইন্টারাপশনস ইন দ্য মর্নিং সেশন আই হোপ দ্যাট উইল নট ইন্টারাপ্ট আস এনি ফার্দার সো আই উইল উই উইল স্টার্ট উইথ দ্য সেকেন্ড মডিউল উইচ ইউ হ্যাভ আই এম শিওর অলরেডি হ্যাভ গন থ্রু থ্রু দ্য আর্লিয়ার রেকর্ডেড ভিডিও and uh, we will <coughs> elaborate uh, various aspects uh, now so <coughs> as uh, professor chakraborty was uh, um, uh, specifying we were taking look into the overall approach uh, to problem uh, design so how to write the specifications and uh, how to uh, identify the basic model and uh, start uh, looking into the possible different designs that we can choose from the basic exploration aspect naturally as we uh, get into exploration get into exploring different options one of the main tool to decide on what uh, which design is a more preferred one compared to another design the main criterion for uh, this choice as we do the exploration would be the different aspects of analysis so in this uh, session today in the next one hour we'll take a quick look in the different uh, issues and uh, approaches to analysis so that's why we are calling this the element of algorithm analysis now <coughs> obviously when we present this uh, to the student the best way as we feel uh, should be to talk about is instead of just trying starting with uh, this is the analysis that we do and so on we would rather like to ask a couple of questions and start with their answers uh, so the first question is why do we analyze so this is to set the motivation for algorithm analysis as to why is it important to analyze at all the next question would be what do we analyze if we are analyzing we need to identify what all that needs to be analyzed so we say what to analyze then certainly the deep question which uh, has a, a lot of different approaches techniques and lot of depth in mathematics if you go deeper and deeper that is how do we do the analysis learn the techniques of analysis how to where do you uh, apply the analysis that is understand the scenarios of the application where you will apply what is being learnt in terms of analysis and what is the context in which you seek for the analysis so which is when do you analyze so why what how where and when are the basic questions about analysis that we would like to answer in this session so the first is uh, certainly why we analyze we analyze because uh, the practical reasons are the resources are scarce that is whatever the resources you have uh over the years the computational resources have increased and is continuing to increase by leaps and bounds be it the processor speed to the available memory and so on but whatever increase we have we still rem this resources still remain scarce given the kind of problems we solve at that time so to put it put it uh, crisply there's a greed to do more with less that's the main reason that whatever we have we want to do more with that certainly we need to analyze because we want to avoid variety of performance bugs so some of the major issues uh, core issues will involve how do we predict performance that is how much for example we for a binary search I, we want to know how much time does binary search take we want to compare algorithms like find want to find out how quick really is quick sort we want to provide uh, guarantees like uh, guarantees like a red if i have a red black tree uh, then all inserts can be done in order log n time or you want to understand different theoretical basis like sorting can never be done for n numbers in less than n log n time and so on so these are the core issues that we want answers for and that is the reason we will analyze naturally moving on to what do we analyze certainly <coughs> the the principle is we cannot 
control something unless we can measure it. So, what we analyze is what we are able to measure. So, the core issue here is what we analyze is whatever can be measured. Naturally, uh, instinctively we, we relate uh, analysis uh, primarily for time or rather put, put it in more crisp terms the effort that we need to solve a problem. And uh, interestingly this goes back to very early days of uh, computing when mechanical hand operated computers like analytical engines were in uh, use. Even then people were trying to find out that how many times you need to rotate the wheels of the analytical engine to solve add two numbers. So, that now translates to finding out uh, what is the time required the most common uh, factor and uh, but there are several other uh, analysis factors like power, bandwidth, processor as the computing uh, system keeps on moving what we analyze keeps on also moving further and time uh, analysis is uh, supported by various complexity classes. Certainly the second and equally important uh, factor of analysis is space which is also widely explored and uh, with the advent and wider use of handheld devices the analysis of space is becoming even more significant because handheld devices has very limited space. So, earlier we uh, I mean when we are on a desktop we really do not care as to how much uh, space often an algorithm takes or we never talk about how big is the size of a code we always talk about how much space the data will take but we never con are concerned with how much size the code will take. We, we never lo even look into the size of a dot out or exe because it really does not matter I mean they, they reside in the disk and practically it is considered infinite. But when it comes to handheld devices both the code and the data reside on the same memory which is limited and therefore, even the code size matters code footprint matters a lot. So, space uh, needs to be analyzed for that and there are it is also supported by a number of complexity classes. So, there are uh, we can take uh, small examples that is uh, say we take examples of adding uh, natural numbers and finding minimum of sequence of numbers. So, if this is uh, the this is a code to add uh, the natural numbers then we can easily find out what is the time complexity of this. So, how do we define the time complexity we will define the time complexity in terms of some of the key operations that uh, are performed in this algorithm. So, we uh, do they see this uh, marker or so if we uh, if we look at this uh, addition operation which is key for finding out the sum then counting the number of uh, additions will tell us how many. So, um, I, ca I can uh, we can easily see that uh, this will take if we say T n is a time or the number of additions then T n would be n in this case approximately and the space taken will be 2 because we have 2 variables n and s which need to be stored. So, when we are analyzing we are basically trying to find out such factors which will tell us that if we have some arbitrarily large natural number to add up to then how much time and how much space will it we be spending for that. Similarly, if we are finding the minimum of a sequence of numbers this is some uh, form of a code you have already seen these codes in the video earlier and uh, we want to since we want to find out the minimum we will here concentrate more on this comparison which is a key operation in finding out the minimum and try to count the number of uh, comparisons that we can have and we will have <coughs> the T n or time is the number of comparisons of value which is n minus 1 and the space is n plus 3 for the array and for the different variables n i and t. And you may note that uh, in just uh, studying this we have ignored comparisons like uh, the comparison of the index variable here or the index variable here we can also bring those in into the analysis. So, these are the different factors that we analyze for and that same code if we rewrite. So, that uh, the in the in the in the earlier version we act read all the numbers in the array and then find the minimum and in this version we do it kind of on the fly then both will give us the same result. So, far as the minimum is concerned, but uh, 
the time complexity does not change because the number of comparisons are still the same, but the space complexity changes because now we are not storing. So, we can do it with a constant amount of space. So, uh, we are trying to uh, we are just trying to show these uh, uh, different alternates. These are simple ones, but uh, these alternates will uh, sensitize us to the factor that uh, if we look at the, we are just taking look into how to formulate finding the minimum of a set of numbers in terms of a recursive uh, definition, and it depends on how you how we do that, whether we store the numbers or you do it on the fly or we do it through some other technique, and then we extract the performance or, or the analysis of each one of these options as we just did for the two options and that comparison will tell us what is a more preferred way of doing this. Here we saw an example where the time really does not change, but the space becomes better as we uh, look at the second option compared to the first. Now, so to analyze <coughs> we need different techniques. So, this is we are going moving on to the third question as to how do we analyze and uh, naturally if we say so look at uh, analysis uh, in very simple terms in terms of uh, analyzing time or analyzing memory then in some way we need to answer as to what are we really interested in. Now, it could be answered in two possible ways. One is I have a problem be it uh, finding the minimum of n numbers or finding a factorial of certain number or finding n Fibonacci numbers or as uh, we were discussing in the morning finding out the roots in a city map and so on. In terms of analysis are we really interested to know that given a particular input how much of resource would we need that is basically what matters that if I have a sorting program it sorts numbers I have a my computer and if I give it 10,000, 100,000, 1 million, 10 million numbers how much time will it take to sort that that is that is a core question that we want to answer. Now, the point is how do you answer that one is one certainly way is to look into the problem, have a solution, implement that solution, put it to a machine, actually observe how much time it has taken and so that is that would be the most brute force way of doing that. Now, the problem with that kind of a approach would be that we want the answer of the analysis to decide what kind of solution we do, but if we have to implement and then observe then we first have the solution and only then we will have the analysis. So, they come in the wrong order, but we I, I first need the analysis to decide what solution will I have. So, I need some way of forecasting that uh, if I use this uh, approach of analysis or if I use this algorithm then what kind of resources will I get. Now, as it turns out that every machine has so much of different complex uh, structure and so much of different models involved in that. that given a problem it is impossible to say how much time will it take or how much space will it take. So, to be able to get an idea about how much time it might take I need to do some kind of counting. So, a gross range of uh, analysis approaches if not almost all analysis approaches involve some kind of counting. So, it is it has to count in some way as to what is the most dominant factor that will decide my time, that will decide my space, that will decide my power, that will decide my bandwidth. I mean in the morning we were having the same complexity problems of trying to broadcast the video where the channel did not have adequate bandwidth. So, now if we have to do that then how can I do it? One is a simple the last two examples we show. So, we have the code we just keep on counting it is a simple problem it is possible to count possible to write it in terms of a uh, closed form functional equation and such approaches we will grossly group as mathematical or counting models of analysis. Naturally if I have to count I arbitrarily said that uh, I will uh, 
count only the comparisons or comparisons of values or just the additions. So, I must have some model for doing the analysis and the model that we will use for analysis that is very widely uh, prevalent is known as the RAND model or the random access machine model. Uh, please do not confuse it with uh, RAM as in memory. This is a very common term in, in uh, algorithm analysis that we talk about RAM. So, what we say is uh, we assume that uh, we have a mathematical model of a machine may not be actual physical one where we can make an estimate of the size of my input that is how many numbers or what size of matrix or what is really interesting. <coughs> the RAM machine gives me certain basic operators to operate with. Now, what operators is a wide choice. It could be arithmetic operators like add, subtract, multiply. It could be uh, logical operators like compare or it could be some complex operators also. But we have to have certain assumptions about the num different variety of operators to have some idea about the size of output it produces. And we will assume that we have a mathematical model as we are saying is a random access or RAM model where we have a definition for the input size, the operators are primitives and the output size and we will try to relate how many times every operator will be used for a given input size to produce a corresponding output size. Now, you will obviously question how does it hold for your machine, my machine, his machine, hard machine because all, all machines are different. Fortunately, most of the machines that uh, we use or a large section of machines that we use are inherently built on the RAM model, which historically traditionally is a simplification of the von Neumann model that we started computing with. Now, naturally there are this is not the only computing model that or that is not the only mathematical model for analysis. We have variety of parallel models SIMD, MIMD, different distributed models and so on. Depending on the model that we choose, the analysis methods will be different, the analysis results will also be different. For example, if I have 5 processors to divide a task and execute them, then the kind of time it will take will be different from if I had to do all of that with a single processor which is a single model. So, certainly as if we as we study algorithms all these ramifications of all these different models come into play, but in since we are at the at a first level course a relatively elementary introductory level of algorithm design is being taught we will restrict ourselves to a so called single processor or a single RAM model which has a set of uh, operators which can operate on the data. It can define as input with its size, it can has a corresponding output with its size. So, given that the core idea of the computing model is to find the total running time as you find out what are the different operators if you know the cost of every operator or rather in other words how much time does every operation take and if you can find out how many times each operator is done, then it is basically a product sum of these products how many times each oper how many times oper add is done. If you know the time of add multiply that you get total addition time similarly total multiplication time and so on and together that gives you. So, that is a basic simple and uh, very effective way to analyze algorithms particularly in terms of time. Now, naturally there are questions are all, all operators equally costly? No, some operators will take less time, some will take more time. The question is uh, will the cost of doing an operation say addition be same in all machines? No, but certainly if I need to do 5000 additions, then in one machine it may have a cost of 1 nanosecond in another it may have 1.3 nanosecond. So, more or less they will be proportional, they would they would be within a, a, a multiplicative factor the numbers would corroborate. 
So, what we simplify the RAM model with we assume that the operators have certain amount of constant cost that is a simplification that is mostly we will try to perform if some operators are exp very expensive for example, you can never compare the cost of multiplication with the cost of addition the multiplication inherently is a lot more complex. So, we can say that we will take the multiplication cost separately and addition cost separately, but primary assumption of the RAM, RAM model is take the operator costs as, as given constants. And then the basic counting model is to find out this frequency and with that with simple analysis we can form a number of different time and space analysis of different algorithms. So, this is the first most elementary, but one of the most effective approaches of doing algorithm analysis. Now, certainly it, it always will not hold equally well. So, on the screen there is a query is uh, can we assume that two large numbers of arbitrary size can be added in constant time. I am saying that add is constant adding two numbers is a constant operator. So, if it, it will take a fixed amount of time irrespective of the numbers. So, the time taken to add 3 with 5 and the time taken to add 300 with 500 would be same, but will it hold if my numbers are really really large. For example, if I have 3 trillion 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 added with 5 trillion 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 will it still be the same cost? No. So, there is always certain sizing under which this RAM machine model will work and that if we when we relate it to other other areas of computer science like particularly computer organization and we look into the size of the resistors and all that we will understand how far we can assume the costs to be constant when the costs start becoming different. But for reasons of simplicity we keep that in whole of analysis discussion in algorithms we typically keep the operator costs to be constant in nature. So, we can quickly uh, take a look at a uh, couple of examples. This is a simple way to uh, find factorial. Certainly, we can say the time the cost here is n minus 1 because we are assuming that this particular algorithm in the RAM model has multiple operations to do. So, if you look at the operations, uh, what are the different types of operations we have? We have operations of subtraction n minus 1. We have operation of subtraction here though it is implicit because you are saying that uh, uh, so subtraction and comparison are, are actually the same. We have multiplication and we have a whole number of assignment copying which is not explicit in this code, but implicit. For example, if you do return you are actually copying values. So, of all this we make a ballpark well this is primarily about multiplication and we inherently assume that multiplication has more constant cost than addition or assignment. So, if I can know the number of multiplications I am doing then more or less I will have an idea about how much time will it take. So, that is n minus 1 and the space taken will be also a factor of n which uh, is not evident if we look into the code, but it will become clear when we actually so, if we if we just uh, uh, look at uh, uh, computing this then if I am trying to do say f 8 then that is basically turning out to be goes on like this in this way till I come to f 1 say f 2. for which I know that the value is 1. So, when I want to compute f 8 actually I go into recursive call 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 and then I come back come back come back and every time I do a multiplication here. So, when I have gone to the depth when finally, I get hit the base condition at that time so many calls of the factorial function actually exist in memory at the same time. Therefore, I need so many different locations to be available and that is uh, what is the reason that the space here turns out to be linear. 
though you do not see an array in the code explicitly. So, such small factors will have to be uh, always looked into. So, this is a computing factorial in another form, this is just uh, doing it iteratively, you can very easily understand the time taken will be will still be n multiplications, but uh, space has now got reduced drastically to only 2 because you do not have that recursive tree happening inside the code. So, <coughs> in general terms to define how do you count the way we are counting it is certainly more it is not easy for a more complex code. So, we follow the general technique of recurrence relation to count which simply says that uh, if I have a problem of size n to solve I will assume that it has a complexity some f n t n and I will try to define from the algorithm I will try to discover as to how that complexity function can be defined in terms of itself and when I am able to do that I say it is a recurrence relation. So, I can we can look at uh, one two simple examples I will not go into there are number of uh, worked out examples in the presentation that uh, if you need you can look at. So, you are saying that for the sum of natural numbers we just counted the number of additions by I would say our intelligence our, our basic arithmetic ab abilities we can do it in a structured way that said if the number is T n then T n is T n minus 1 plus 1 that is if I know how many number of additions I will need to add n minus 1 numbers I am actually adding n the nth number with that sum. So, I need one more addition therefore, if n is greater than 1 this is the recurrence I get and when n is 1 I do not need to or a basically this could be 0 actually this. So, then I can <coughs> keep on substituting T n in, in uh, each and every stage and if I solve this recurrence I get the solution. So, one very common uh, way of uh, solving or counting operations is in terms of building up the recurrence relation and solving that recurrence relation and we will see that to be the general strategy of solution in a large number of cases. So, the next couple of examples actually uh, work that out this is for the recursive uh, factorial. So, the recurrence relations are given for time and space they can be easily solved. Similarly, for iterative uh, solution of uh, the factorial. So, we will we'll skip this. Now, when you come to say you apply the same technique on Fibonacci, this is just to show that it is not always so easy to just substitute and solve the recurrence. So, when it comes to Fibonacci, you are solving this Fibonacci problem. Now, how many additions will you need? Again, again, the main operation is addition. Now, certainly, this is if that it takes t n additions to find the Fibonacci of n then this turns out to be the number of operations needed number of additions needed in this part number of additions needed in this part and this one addition. So, t n is t n minus 1 plus t n minus 2 plus 1 and it is 0 otherwise if it is 0 or 1. Now, this kind of a recurrence is not easy to solve by substitution because you will find if you substitute t n minus 1 you will get a t n minus 2 and a t n minus 3. So, you have now 2 t n minus 2s and if you keep on expanding. So, in in uh, in terms of uh, Fibonacci if you keep on expanding that uh, that tree. So, if we can just uh, uh, so it is if I do say t 4 is t 3 plus t 2 plus 1. So, that is t 2 plus t 1 plus t 2 plus 1 or in other words that is 2 t 2 plus t 1 plus 1. So, if I substitute t 2 it is 2 t 1 plus 2 t 0 plus t 1 plus 1. So, this is 3 t 1 plus 2 t 0 plus 1 it goes like this. So, these factors are not really very simple factors and as it turns out they themselves turn out to be some functions of the Fibonacci numbers and therefore, you use other techniques of generating function we, we will not discuss about generating functions here because that needs uh, some bit of depth. 
where you set up uh, this is, this techniques are very similar to the way you solve differential equation generating functions are are used in a similar manner in which you solve differential equation because these are difference equations and you you can prove that you find something like tn will become a phi to the power n where phi has a very peculiar uh, expression known as the golden uh, ratio so those those details are not specific all that we are trying to illustrate that one of the major techniques of analysis is setting up the recurrence and then trying to solve that recurrence and these are some of the uh, very special uh, I mean some of the difficult cases for that Fibonacci can also be solved by storing the numbers and certainly the recurrence become easier because you store the numbers. So, your space complexity increases, but your time is better. Let us skip these uh, details this is a you can study the more improved code for this then iterative Fibonacci and all that, but <coughs> let me move on to the next approach to analysis. So, what uh, uh, we quickly try to look at is uh, our analysis this is getting into some recursive call at times it is it's that video itself is getting recursive at times I do not know there is some complexity involved here. Okay. So, in terms of how to analyze the first approach is, is basically different forms of counting forming recurrence relation. Now, as it turns out if as your problem gets more and more complex your algorithm gets more and more complex solving the corresponding recurrence relations in exact form turns out to be almost impossible. And then you start questioning as really the machines vary the actual running cost of operators vary actual exact numbers may vary very widely with the input size. Am I really interested to know the exact expression of in terms of a function of input size as to how many operations will get done or what is a more interesting question is not specifically as to given a particular input how much time will it take. More interesting question is if I keep on making my input bigger and bigger and bigger say by every stage we might make my input double the size of the previous input size or 10 times the size of the previous input size then how will my cost or how will my complexity or how will my time keep on changing. So, that tells me that does not tell me how much time will it take on my machine, but it does tell me that my ability to solve bigger and bigger problems. I started by saying why we analyze we need to utilize resources better we need to do more with less we are greedy. So, basic requirement is that we can make our problem size bigger and bigger and still be able to solve them given the resources that we have. So, instead of so there is a there is a subtle change in the viewpoint that we are making in adopting to the more complex situations of analysis we are saying let us change the questions I am not asking as to given an input size n given n numbers how much time will it take to sort by quick sort I am not asking that very specifically what I am asking is if I keep on doubling n indefinitely for a large number of time how will my time keep on changing will it also just be doubling or it will change by a different factor. So, we move from the actual cost to the growth of cost and that change in point of view changes the whole approach to analysis. And that is what brings us to what all of us know all of you have been teaching is the sense of asymptotic analysis. So, we, we really do not care what the actual cost is what we care is if we keep on increasing the input size by a certain factor how will my what is the rate at which my overall cost will keep on increasing. So, as again little bit of mathematics will tell us that for example, if my if my complexity function is a polynomial let us say if we, if I have certainly if I find out for some t n not necess not the Fibonacci one, but for some t n suppose I have been able to find out that the complexity the time taken is a function of my input size n in this way. 
Now, if I keep on increasing n by a factor say if I keep on doubling n, then what will happen? If I keep on doubling n, this does not change, this is a constant. What this happens? This will simply double. Every time I double n, the factor of 2 n, if n is 5, it is 10, if n is 10, it will become 20, if n is 20, it will become 40 like this. So, it will simply double. What will happen to this? It will change by a factor of 4. So, change also of all factors are not same, but certainly if, if my function is polynomial, the particular term which has the highest degree will see the maximum rate of growth and we will say this has no growth, this is constant, we will say this has linear growth and this has quadratic growth. So, we would like to say that well I can roughly say that T n will change as a quadratic function and build up our logic based on that. Now, you will say that in reality it may not so happen so, it may be that the function is like this. So, when n changes n doubles this because this is a very large constant this factor will change become much bigger faster than this factor with this will increase by 4 also, but this is I am sorry this is there is, has to be a 1 sorry. So, it is possible. So, when we look at analysis in asymptotic terms we normally ignore such factors. We say okay, if some constant is extremely small or extremely large, we will take care of them separately. As it turns out, in majority of problems, the factors, these terms are not really that out of line, they are somewhat small numbers. But even if something is very small or something is very large, we will ignore that. We will say that we are interested to know what is the term that dominates. So, that if I arbitrarily keep on increasing n that is the term which will primarily decide how my complexity will grow and those kind of approaches are known as asymptotic analysis. We, we, all, we all know what, uh, what uh, asymptotes are right I mean it is the name certainly uh, comes from that uh, we had uh, if we have a hyperbola like this. Uh, if we have a hyperbola like this, then we say that these are asymptotes of that, these axes are the asymptotes of this hyperbola, which is basically a, 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 a the, the sense comes from the fact that this is a line, x is a line or y is a line. So, that if you keep on moving along this curve, it will get more and more close to this line x, but it will never reach that. So, kind of you can take that this is the ultimate that I can have. So, that is the basic sense of asymptotic analysis from where the concept is borrowed and uh, we say that we will take approximations look at the growth primarily and based on that we have devised a set of new notation to talk about the complexity. Because now we are we are kind of getting convinced that it is not the absolute number that matters it is a growth that we are more interested in and in the growth if it is a complex function we cannot really handle that. So, it is the dominant part of the growth that we are interested in and we would like to put algorithms into different buckets based on based on the main dominant factors that need to be taken care of. Okay. So, that is what leads to the different big O notations and those. So, let us quickly take a look at that. So, this is here is a is kind of a <coughs> nested loop which uh, tries to find out if a i plus a j is 0. <coughs> I know so which pairs turn out to be 0. So, actual code is not very important except that you can see that this runs from 1 to n, this runs from i plus 1 to n and if this sum is 0 then you add the increment the count by 1. Now, 
the table below has been carefully filled up with the analysis from first principle the simple counting principle so you do this you can you can spend your time and actually fill up the table in a similar manner these will match and in some cases you can get the exact expression in some cases like how many times would you increment this depends on the data because you will increment if this succeeds so there is a possibility of none of them succeeding there is a possibility of all of them succeeding that gives the range now certainly this kind of an analysis would have been very painstaking so what you can observe if you look into the same table that basically if we talk about growth then i am not interested in n plus 2 but n plus 2 basically means n it will grow like n similarly this uh, <coughs> whole thing like half into this will basically grow as half of n square so this is what we say as the approximation in mathematical terms it means that if i if this is uh, one function and this is the approximate function then if i take their ratios and let n tend to infinity then that ratio turns out to be 1 then we say they are they have similar growth it is a very very rough definition but it is a very handy definition when you are looking at algorithm so if, if there is a nested loop our first instinct is there is a nested loop so one runs from 1 to n another runs from 1 to n i to n 1 to i any of these it is basically taking them as pairs so it is some kind of nc2 formula works so it is some form of a n square plus b n plus c so i can say it is n square so that is that is the kind of simplification and and the ease of uh, analysis that you get into so this is uh, just uh, detailing that more actually i have taken the uh, this from sedgwick's book this example from sedgwick's books and the analysis from sedgwick's book and this is what uh, I, I really want you to focus on that you will say well with this i i can know these are the dominant terms and from the dominant term i can say that this is this grows like n square this grows like n cube this grows like n but there are so many possibilities but again then the real world is fortunate that way if you if you look into the variety of algorithms then it as it turns out there are only a few simple functions which happen in terms of the growth functions and they are kind of here the constant function the log function the linear uh, arithmetic linear linear arithmetic quadratic like this and this plot is interesting which uh, gives us the real insight into uh, what is decided by the complexity this is a log log plot so the input as well as the output both are plotted in terms of their log factors so if you look at the uh, log log plot then you can see that this is the linear is what is the middle line so your input grows your time grows proportionately to that certainly constant is which does not change quad so what will happen with quadratic cubic basically the slopes of these functions are factors of 2 and 3 and those that happen logarithmic we can see is very close to the linear and that is that is what makes logarithm really interesting that it is it changes with n but it changes very slowly with n so if you look at log log n it will change even more slowly with n if you have log 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 n it will change even more slowly with that so logs are very important linear arithmetic which is n log n is very close to linear does not change that so this gives us the spectrum so as we move from uh, in anti clockwise on this uh, chart of common growth functions the moment we cross somewhere like quadratic the slope is really really steep and therefore it gets into kind of algorithms which practically we cannot run so here is a chart of uh, different examples of where you get this complexity functions we will skip that now based on this we have defined a few basic notations for complexity and it is it is important to understand them so we are saying that suppose i have a function like this then we will say that we all know we will say that this is this is a uh, order n squared now what does this uh, big order n squared mean suppose
So, we will have something like this and if I plot n square naturally at 0 it will be 0 and it is a quadratic curve and this will also be a quadratic curve. Now, we will say that uh, f n is order of this provided two conditions satisfy. One is I have a certain value of the input parameter say n naught. So, that if my n is beyond that if my n is more than that, then this function will always dominate my function f. So, if we so if we look into the first line it, it looks So, I, I just I just copied the expression that is that is written in that slide. So, it says that there exists some n naught. So, that if your input is greater than that, then there is some constant. So, that this function is less than c times constant times the order function n. So, what it will mean that in our case there is a fun constant. So, that c is less than equal to f n is less than equal to c times n square. If that happens, then we will say that f n is order n square. This is a basic notion we are that this notation means. So, there is a there is a very common uh, question uh, in terms of uh, what if uh, what is order n square what is finally order n square when you say order n square what is that it means now we found that fn is order n square there was some some arbitrary fn we had an arbit 3n square plus 4n minus 17 was order n square similarly 9n square plus uh, 3n minus 52 will be order n square 3000 n square minus 12 will be order n square and so on interestingly 5 n is order n square right 5 n is also order n square because you can you will be able to find an n n naught beyond which there is a constant by which it is always less. So, order n square and this is what uh, often often I find missing while we discuss with students is basically a set it is a collection of functions it is not one function it is a collection of functions potentially infinite. So, that for all of them this condition holds that all of their behavior is in terms of what I can capture by order n square. Now, so what will happen if I, so if this is a set, if this is a set order n square and if this is a set order n, what can we say? So, I can similarly have sets like order n what can we say is the relation between them is there a relation certainly there will be we will have that order n is a subset of order n square. So, in many of these the the growth function was chosen in a way so, so that it is they not only define a family of complexities, but there is a hierarchy in them. So, you say anything something which is order n square I will not be concerned to find out whether it is order n cube because it is obviously order n cube it does not matter, but I will be concerned to find out is this function order n. So, that is the basic point in the asymptotic analysis that we use in terms of understanding the complexity. So, on this hierarchy what will happen what will be there at the bottom of this hierarchy is order 1 functions that take constant little over them if we could uh, just uh, uh, do, do a simple diagram this is order 1 this is order log n this is order n this is order n square or in between them is another order n log n and so on. So, 
our objective is in terms of analysis and in terms of making the right choice from the design space is to come from a higher complexity order to the lower complexity order so that i can have a better algorithm and i'm in this process i'm trying to eliminate lot of other nitty gritties that would have arisen because of your machine is different from mine intel machine is different from spark architecture it has got uh, linux that has got windows i'm leaving out all of those because they practically finally does not matter so far as a choice is concerned because i'm not interested to solve one instance of the problem i'm interested to see if i change my instance of the problem if i make more and more and more large problems how will that impact the whole computation and that is how the choice will have to be that's the reason that what uh, fundamentally dominates analysis is the asymptotic form of analysis and it's very important to understand them so with this uh, <coughs> let me uh, just uh, uh, come to the third approach uh, or rather uh, tricks of uh, analysis which is known as the master theorem um, antonio could you ask for some more water the master theorem basically is a theorem which tells me how to solve some of the very typical recurrence as well so i'll just uh, in the next uh, two slides i'll just make two illustrations one is really in in simple terms how to uh, solve recurrences and one method that is obvious is by substitution which we saw simple examples the other method which is very powerful is by hypothesis and test how do you solve for a recurrence close your eyes and guess that's it just close your eyes and guess now you will find this is wild why are you saying i'm going to close my eyes and guess yes it's wild but the point is it still works for for the for two reasons one reason it will work is if you if you look into the different complexity classes uh, different expressions growth expressions that uh, i charted out you'll find that every growth expression has certain typical kind of algorithmic strategy that gets associated if it's nested then it adds one order of complexity divide conquer typically gives you some kind of log factor if you if you have square root somewhere happening in the input size that leads to log log of n so on so you have some sense of what kind of structure might lead what kind of to what kind of complexity the other factor of advantage is that there are not too many complexity classes maybe most algorithms fall into one of the 10 12 complexity classes there are algorithms which is n to the power 2.87 naturally needs little bit more you know flash of the mind to solve them but usually majority of the algorithms are linear log n n log n n square n cube this kind of so it is possible to guess make a good guess and then try to just try out with that does your recurrence satisfy so hypothesis and test is a very effective strategy of analysis so which means that the core issue of analysis reduces to formulating the recurrence right and the second way is a number of recurrence relations come under a common structure so learn that structure have a master theorem to solve them so these are the two things we will quickly illustrate so this is uh, this is one uh, uh, problem which we will come back to while we do uh, uh, searching more this is finding out the kth largest number or kth smallest number in a list of n numbers all of us know how to do it right all of us know how will you do it you'll sort the numbers and take the kth number that's that's a obvious that's a obvious way of doing it and if you do that sorting we know takes n log n time so finding the kth largest in n log n time so it needs the brilliance of some computer scientist who could give this algorithm that you can find the kth largest number in linear time no matter what is the value of k it works for the maximum it works for the minimum it works from any number it works for the median so there is a recursive uh, decomposition of this problem today i will not go into the details of 
how this works because this problem this particular algorithm is by itself quite interesting and if you listen to the um, uh, video of the previous session we have discussed it at length i will also touch upon this while we do uh, sorting algorithms particularly but this is just to show certain formulation that uh, it 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 every stage we have tried to put what the complexities are for so it takes the input divides it into 5 uh, n by 5 groups of 5 elements sorts each group finds out the median of each group finds the median of median and then so done some rearrangement so if you do all of this we are not not please don't get uh, uh, intimidated that we are going fast on a complex algorithm we are not studying this algorithm my interest is to show that if you look at every stage then you can express it in terms of a recurrence relation as given in the bottom so it is tn turns out to be tn by 5 plus t 3 n by 4 plus c n do not worry about how we got this we will discuss that later on our interest is to solve this because we are doing analysis so given this how do we solve so this is a simple uh, example where it is if you try to solve by substitution and all that it will turn out to be extremely complex at least i do not know how to solve them in that method but do a simple thing just assume that it is linear so if you assume it it is linear then all that you need to show that is you want to show that it is order n so if it is to be order n then all that you need to show is tn is less than some d times n so you need to show that there exists a constant d for which it happens n not is already known the cutoff is already known here so you assume that it holds and you simply start putting it so t n by 5 is d times n by 5 t 3 n by 4 is less than equal to d 3 n by 4 so tn you just substitute in terms of these d's after some arithmetic you get that this has to happen it is 19 by 20 d plus c n is less than equal to so if you can choose a d which satisfies this condition then you have a value of d that's the most important fact you can we can work this that 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 out uh, later on but uh, this is just an illustration that you can just make a hypothesis and prove that that hypothesis holds if this did not hold then you would not be able to solve for this d that's a simple thing so that's one way of solving the other way is to use a masters theorem masters theorem goes like uh, this <coughs> this is a general form of a recurrence tn is a times tn by b plus fn what does it come from certainly the it can come from various different strategies that we will come to from the recursive decomposition but this immediately tells us divide and conquer n by b means it is being divided into b parts every and of those a of them need to be solved so it is a times tn by b and at every stage you need this additional cost which is fn some function of n <coughs> then depending on the relations if fn is of the order of n to the power d then depending on the relations of a b and d these solutions are what is known how you how you prove one is you do substitution and prove them that's one way of doing it otherwise how you do you just use the previous technique if if somebody has already done it you are trying to prove so you hypothesize that this is true apply the formula of the notation and then show that it holds so if your recurrence is of one of these forms and it's very important for any practitioner of algorithms to remember the master theorem not only know it in philosophy but remember it because that becomes some very handy because the moment you have the recurrence you immediately know what the solution is that does not solve all problems in life mind you but that solves a large number of problems in life in fact there are special cases of fn also for which so if this function is a polynomial and if you have this decomposition then it the solution is immediately known obviously it will not work for many cases for example if if it is a periodic function if it is a power of 2 if it is square root of n 
things will not work, but for a large cases number of cases this will work out. So, here there are some examples worked out even in the problem set we have given a number of examples. So, to, to summarize we have uh, in terms of uh, how to analyze uh, we have talked about and this was the main uh, part that we wanted to talk about. We have talked about three basic approaches one on top of the other. First principle is to be able to count. To be able to count you assume a RAM model on which all of our analysis will be built on. First approach is to physically try to count that turns out to be more difficult. So, you build recurrence relations. Recurrence relations in general become more very complex to analyze. So, you realize, so you look back and decide that it is not important to have the exact complexity of a given input size. All that you need to know is how does the input, the complexity grow as you grow the input size. So, you just solve it in the asymptotic sense and to be able to solve it in the asymptotic sense, you have two, one handy theorem, the master theorem that you can use if you if it falls fits into that form and otherwise in general it is some hard mathematics or closing your eyes making a guess and tr proving that it does belong to that complexity class. So, that is the whole whole approach that it turns out to be. Okay. So, with this uh, uh, let me move on to the last uh, uh, two how much time do we have uh, Antonio? One hour, One hour pass. So, we can take 10 minutes to close. Okay. So, the two other factors I will come back to these uh, more and more, but uh, the question is uh, will the algorithm behave uniformly for all kinds of inputs, where in what kind of input would you apply your analysis. For example, if you ha you are trying to sort n numbers, you are doing something like bubble sort. The numbers are already sorted in the order in which you want them to be sorted. It is a single pass of bubble sort which will decide that the numbers are sorted. So, it becomes linear, but we all know that in general it is not that. So, there are different situations that an algorithm can get into based on the different distribution of inputs. The algorithm all algorithms do not behave uniformly with all inputs. So, we categorize the inputs in different forms and that has given rise to a, a variety of strategies for analysis and also design of algorithms. Certainly, the first in this is the best case. Okay, so, the, what is the input given an algorithm? What is the input for which my algorithm will behave in the most simple manner or the least cost manner? That is the best case. So, I am doing bubble sort, things are sorted in the same direction is a best case for bubble sort. Other is and what is more common is the worst case. So, in worst case what we talk about is if we could consider all possible inputs then what is the input which will make my algorithm do maximum amount of work. Now, the maximum amount of work is a sense in terms of time. If the complexity parameter is different your sense of that work will be different, but the idea is what is the worst possible input. So, far as the performance of my algorithm is concerned that is the worst case and that is what we mostly always talk about. So, that is the other way of looking at it. The third which is also very common we say is the average case that how will it behave in average. Now, the moment you say it is an average case you get yourself into some sticky areas because if you have to say how will how will it behave on the average, then you are saying that with all inputs it will not behave in the same way. If you take a simple case of bubble sort given a set of numbers, it can have best case, it can have worst case, it can have some intermediate case. Now, in each one of these it will take different kinds of complexity numbers so far as comparison is concerned. So, what is the sense of average case? You will need to know which of these inputs will occur and you have possibly no way of knowing which of these inputs will occur. So, you make another very strong underlying assumption you assume 
that all inputs are uniformly likely. So, average case goes with a, a underlying assumption that it is average over all cases assuming that all cases are equally likely and in your situation that may be true that may not be true. Average case may be very optimistic because it may so happen that you are given in a situation where only worst case or something near the worst case happens others do not happen. Optimistic, pessimistic anything can be, but average case means that it is assuming that your input is uniformly distributed. So, you say that if it is if my input is arbitrary we loosely say if it is random it is not always if we take an input we say it is a random input that is not a very correct statement and with algorithm analysis paradigm we will be careful about this because if when you say something is random it has certain mathematical properties to satisfy, but we colloquially say something is random to mean that something is arbitrary. What we are saying is it is it has equal expectation from all possible inputs that is average case. Now, these three have been the more uh, traditional ones, but what has over the time gaining ground is really that best cases if the best case prevailed then computer scientists will lose their job because there are not enough problems to solve. If the worst case dominate then you will not be able to grow your solution average cases are not realistic. So, you look into situations which are more realistic in nature and two major approaches exist and we will in at least in terms of data structure example I would try to show you exam one example of each just to understand that when you strategize the design space exploration this should also be picked up as exploration one of them is known as a amortized analysis, analysis amortized case. The principle of amortized case is very simple in worst case we are saying that given an input I want to find out what is the time it takes and I will take that input which makes my life worst. In amortized we will not say, in amortized I will say that suppose I have taken 1000 inputs, over this 1000 inputs I will I am not interested to see what a particular input what the cost of executing that, but if I take 1000 inputs I will take the total cost over 1000 inputs and divide it by 1000, I say that is my cost it may be some of them are worst case that will they will really make my life very difficult some of them are really good they will but overall taken everything together i'll have a very peaceful life that's the basic sense of amortization taking it together a very simple example you want to maintain a large list of telephone numbers how do you maintain them so that you can add easily you can delete numbers easily you can search the numbers easily and so on. You know where lot of sophisticated techniques are known to everybody, we, we know that if we do an array we will search will be easier, if we do a list insert delete would be easier. So, we will do binary search tree and all that, but leaving all those aside if we ask in practical terms telephone numbers if there are 1 million telephone numbers how likely is somebody to ask for searching a particular telephone number. I cannot remember when I ever last used a telephone directory to look up my friend's number. Right? I cannot also give an instance where some friend found me from the telephone directory. So, that means, my number is not looked up, your number is not looked up, her number is not looked up. Which numbers are looked up? Emergency numbers, Emergency numbers restaurant numbers. Inox movies numbers and so on. Can we use this in the in the strategy in the design space exploration? Can we incorporate this strategy and come out with very simple algorithms? We will do, we will keep them in the list, all telephone numbers keep them in the list arbitrarily. Now, when a search happens, you go down that list, you will find it somewhere, possibly at a very deep deeper length. When you find it, you bring it to the front, keep it in the front keep on doing this every time you look up something you bring it in the front. If this hypothesis is correct that 10 percent of the numbers are looked up 90 percent of the time, then over a period of operations the 10 percent of the numbers will start crowding in the front, rest 90 percent numbers are later. 
And if somebody happens to hit one of those 90 percent of the numbers, that person will have a huge cost, time cost to find that. Who cares? Because 90 percent of your request will be served very well because they are in the first 10 percent of the list. Now, here that cost, which cost are you concerned about? A particular search for my number, which now happen almost at the end of the list, will be very, very, will be order n, it is very costly. But most numbers, Inox movies numbers, uh, Amri hospital numbers, will come in practically constant time because it is in the front, it is usually not even 10 percent, it is typically 1 percent. So, the list itself will organize, it, get organized, this is a, these are called self organizing lists and make it very efficient to such as a very simple algorithm and that is, there is no major you know data structure or anything involved. But the overall cost I can say is constant. So, if I, if I look into 1 million search attempts, the cost is 1 million units, it is not growing with the input size. So, these are the key, the situations of amortization of cost. And the last, which has gained a lot of ground uh, over the years, is the probabilistic cases. That in average case, we assume that all inputs are equally likely. Now, if it, we know it is not so. Now, in many situations, I may really know what is the probability distribution of the input. If I know that, then can I design algorithms to incorporate that probability distribution? Or if I know that something is not, uni not uniformly distributed, can I make probabilistic choices in my algorithm too? So, these are very interesting algorithms, which use the probabilistic analysis or probabilistic case known as randomized algorithms. A typical structure of these algorithms is in some step of the algorithm, the algorithm will toss a coin it will simply toss a coin and depending on the coin being head or tail, it takes a decision. Now, the first instinct always to such proposals is how do we guarantee correctness, well there are ways to guarantee correctness, but the tossing of the coin is done in a way so that you can get a complexity which otherwise is very difficult to get and we will try to again in as a part of data structure, I will try to outline at least one very efficient data structure, it is getting more and more popular these days, a data structure called skip list, which is an alternate to BSTs and B trees and all that. And it, it is an optimal data structure, but it simply uses a randomization to solve the problem. So, in terms of where you do all this, it will be, we talked about best case, we all know it will not happen. The worst case, very pessimistic, average case, well that is what dominates the analysis, but in many cases the input does not satisfy that. Amortized case which is simple effective strategies of again in data structure we will uh, show examples of that actually we will show how stacks are amortized in all implementation today, stacks are actually amortizedly implemented and the randomized uh, cases where the simple randomized algorithms will work. I think we should uh, stop here on the on the optimality of algorithms, we will talk in the next session. Okay, uh, so, uh, the centers, uh, this is uh, on the basics of the uh, elements of algorithm design. One part I have not uh, yet covered, which uh, I will cover as I go into the uh, data structure in terms of uh, when to use that, the particular uh, optimality issues. So, we will uh, talk about that later on. So, on the uh, four basic questions that we have tried to answer in terms of why we analyze, what we analyze, more significantly how we do the analysis and where all, in what all context uh, we can apply the analysis. Uh, we can now have uh, a question answer session. So, do we need to have a, any break or we can continue no, right now? And this, we go. Hello. <coughs> we need to click and then choose and uh, our best uh, operator is not here or director. Uh, hello, uh, RCID one zero zero five, Anna University, Chennai. 
uh, you had uh, raised a question what is the question can, can you can you hear me if if you did not have a question it's okay you can just uh, keep on listening to our answers to others questions you don't have to you don't need to pass the mic around any okay we'll move on uh, if there is no question then no we'll, question. okay then then we'll move on just 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 keep on listening and go to the next one okay uh, then i'll uh, answer this question uh, Yeah, please. So, uh, we we have uh, uh, specifically three notations that are commonly used, and uh, I just uh, talked of uh, one example uh, of the big O notation, where big O notation uh, says. The, the other conditions are same that we need to have an input size n naught such that we consider for all inputs greater than n naught. So, it is not that for all possible n the conditions will have to happen, but there has to be at least one positive constant n naught beyond which everywhere this condition has to happen. That there has to be a constant c so that f n is bounded by g n like this. If that happens, we say it is big O, and if it is bounded from below, then we say it is omega. So, both are asymptotic approximation. One in one, we are saying that uh, Fn will never exceed C times Gn, and in the other, we are saying that Fn will never be smaller than C times Gn. So, these are the two basic uh, notations. And in very simple terms, we say use the big theta notation to mean that it is big O and omega at the same time. So, it is like we have some C 1 So, we say that we have two constant C 1 and C 2 such that is F n lies between C 1 times G n and C 2 times G n that is it is bounded from both sides by some constant. So, if this happens then we if we simply know this we say it is big O if only this is known we say it is big omega and if it is bounded from both sides we say it is big theta. So, that is the basic uh, notational uh, distinction in mathematical terms that is done. Tomorrow, we will uh, uh, start with uh, some discussions on upper bound and lower bound of uh, solving problems. We will talk about upper bound of algorithms and uh, lower bound of problems and we will show the use of these notations in that context. We will show that why this big O will be always used to talk about uh, algorithms will justify why omega will be used to talk about complexities of inherent complexities of problems and will show why big theta is used for describing optimal complexity of optimal algorithms. But uh, the uh, 
you in the presentation slide also I have put it in a table. So, the mathematically this is what it means big omega big O means that it is bounded from above omega means it is bounded from below and theta means it is bounded within a range within that range. So, it is of the same order that is the basic uh, notation. Okay, we will uh, move on 1025 we have already selected right this this one 1025. We are not being able to put through in the video of 1025 RCID 1025. So, I will read the question that has come in the uh, come to the TA and asymptotic notation what is the difference between lower bound and upper bound time complexity. We will talk about this tomorrow when we will talk about this uh, when we talk about uh, uh, upper bound and time lower bound of complexity time complexity does not happen in this at the same time. We talk about upper bound of algorithms and lower bound of problems we will talk about this at length tomorrow in the morning when we start uh, discussions on the data structure. So, I will skip I am skipping this question. Uh, then uh, I move to RCID 1017 are you there? Uh, RCID can you hear us RCID 1017? Could someone just raise uh, their hand to show that uh, can hear us? So, uh, for RCID 1017 PVG College of Engineering and Technology Pune, the question is what is the common method to solve any kind of recurrence relation? if not so specify suitable method for different types of uh, recurrence equation. Okay. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, the answer to the first part of the question is the common method uh, answer to the common method question is there is no single method that will hold for all kinds of recurrence relation it uh, does not exist, uh, but uh, that some common strategies exist first of all if a recurrence relation is a linear recurrence could I go to the video here. Some of the uh, uh, no general. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. No general method, uh, but uh, for example, for a large number of linear recurrence, like. recurrence of this form where in the recurring term the, the input parameter is a linear function. So, here T n is defined as a linear function of n T a n minus 1. So, when it is a linear function these recurrences are known as linear recurrence. So, this is not a linear recurrence say this is not a linear recurrence but this is a linear recurrence this is a linear recurrence because it is t n minus this refers to n minus 1 here it refers to n by 2. So, for linear recurrence there is a technique called generating function. I just mention it while talking about solving the Fibonacci recurrence, but we are not uh, talking about generating function in in totality because that needs uh, some bit more of time, but linear recurrences mostly can be solved by a technique of generating function. There is a way to set up for every linear recurrence you can set up a polynomial which you can solve and the solution of that polynomial leads to the uh, solution of the recurrence. Uh, the 
The third which uh, is more frequently used in the context of uh, algorithm analysis are the recurrences of this form which we, we already have discussed. Many of them which are covered by the master theorem which in general is is kind of a divide conquer recurrence where you divide the problem in b parts solve a number of them with a certain additional cost of uh, f n. So, master theorem or variations of master theorem can help you solve that, but uh, the remaining ones are mostly as we illustrate it it is uh, hypothesize and test there are not much uh, general, but, but most of the recurrences that uh, are interesting that are really useful in terms of analyzing variety of algorithmic strategies and algorithms uh, usually fall between 2 and 3. So, you can solve by these methods. Okay, we will move on 1056. <coughs> One zero five six. As you mentioned, I am just reading out uh, the the question. This is from uh, one RCID one zero five six Malla Reddy College. As you mentioned, recursive approach and iterative approach of factorial is same. Can you please tell on which condition we should go for recursive and uh, iterative algorithm? I th I think it is it is little misunderstood. We didn't say that recursive and iterative approach uh, of factorial is same. Uh, all all that uh, possibly was illust being illustrated is the number of multiplications you do in the two codes that we presented. The number of multiplication was same, but approaches are certainly different. The other factors uh, will be different, and uh, I would not like to just put a condition to say that for factorial this is better in this case or uh, iterative is better in this case. Rather as we uh, go through uh, professor uh, PPC's uh, lectures tomorrow more, we will try to answer this question in a more general context. I do not want to give this answer because that will uh, bias uh, our thinking process. We do not want to think an answer in that way. We want to actually do the space exploration and uh, I would suggest that you go through that and after that maybe on Wednesday if you still have this question then we can specifically answer that. Otherwise we will this the whole range of uh, choices between iterative, uh, recursive, use of dynamic programming, greedy approach all of these will come from the general formulation that Professor Chakraborty will be talking on. how can be complexity specified with the help of uh, amortized analysis case. Yes, this is a very interesting question. This is from uh, 1099, 1299. right? 1299. This is from uh, the question is from 1299. I uh, will repeat it once more for others. The question is how can complexity be specified with the help of amortized analysis case. Uh, let me uh, first explain why this question is arising because we said that uh, before amortization all other strategies uh, of uh, analysis uh, just emphasize that the complexity is expressed in terms of the input size. We say that sorting is n log n what is n? n is the input size. Binary search is log n what is n? n is the number of elements from which I am trying to search. In amortized as it turns out we are saying that the amortization is over the number of attempts we are making. So, obviously, there is a question of on how many attempts do I report this complexity. So, as it turns out that amortized analysis does take the number of attempts into consideration, but uh, the complexity is not specified keeping the number of attempts in mind. It is assumed that if I have the number of attempts arbitrarily large 
then what that complexity will turn out to be. So, it does not want to say that this algorithm is order n or order 1 in the amortized case if you do 1000 attempts or if you do 10000 attempts or if you do 20000 attempts it does not want does not say it that way. It, if it says that the amortized complexity of this algorithm is order 1 what it means is that its complexity is order 1 for arbitrarily large number of attempts. The specific numbers may vary and we will see uh, in the first lecture of data structure where I mentioned that I will show uh, how and why stacks are implemented in amortized way these days and uh, you will be able to see that there are different implementation parameters which might decide how many attempts will really amortize the cost, but uh, the complexity is expressed still in the same form of a function of being a function of the input size it does not take the number of attempts into consideration. I, I do not know if you if the answer made sense, but well we will have to go with that. 1 to 9 9 uh, can you uh, are you, you you all are being able to hear me properly right. Think so because there are people Hello. There. Yes please. Hello. I can, I can hear you. Uh, yes sir I understand the answer of that question. Okay. Thank you very much ma'am. Hello. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the one three one seven, the question is where does master theorem fail to analyze uh, algorithm? Uh, rather, it I mean it is better to put it in this way that uh, master theorem works only in the context in which it is defined. So, if uh, the, the actual uh, function which is being recursively expressed does not is not a monotone function then this uh, uh, master theorem cannot work, but it also is not true that for all monotone functions master theorem will apply. The final solution has to be a monotone function, so it does not work for uh, uh, say periodic functions, it does not work for uh, exponential functions it does not work for sub exponential functions. So, it is better to take it this way that uh, any recurrence which fits into the given form of uh, T n being a times T of n by b plus a polynomial term a polynomial factor is a general form and there is a vari variant of the polynomial form that works and master theorem is limited to that, but it still has a tremendous impact because a very large number of algorithms and strategies actually uh, uh, fall into this uh, structure of the recurrence that master theorem can help you solve. <coughs> I do not know if this one one we will move on to one one four five. One one four five. Can you hear me? One one four five. Why is it so dark? Oh. Okay. Uh, so from one one four five, the question is: Usually we have seen using the same asymp. Usually we have seen using the same asymptotic notation for the best average and worst case complexity for different algorithms. Can you give the reason for it? Okay. Uh, I am assuming that what you are meaning is the notation in terms of the big O notation. See, the big O notation is a is a representation to for a family of functions, a family of complexity functions. I already explained that big O is a class of functions. Now the question obviously is if I say that this is a quadratic algorithm that is order it has big O of n square complexity in time. That statement will make sense only if I specify as to what kind of inputs I am talking about. So, the complexity expression itself does not express the kind of inputs for which that complexity holds that has to be specified separately. 
So, we will say that quick sort is order n square, we, we keep on making that statement quite often, but a more correct uh, statement accurate statement is quick sort is order n square in the worst case of input, quick sort is order n log n in the average case of input. The notation is simply a mathematical way to represent the class of uh, complexity functions to which it belongs and has nothing to do with uh, the subset of inputs for which it is defined. That subset will have to be defined separately. Let us move on. Any other question left? Which one? I do not know. Can median finding problem be defined comprehensively without using ordering? Uh, uh, RCID 1122, RCID 1122, this Techno India, are you there? Can anyone uh, raise their hand? Yes, yes, good, 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 I can see. Okay. So, the question was uh, can, uh, can median finding problem be defined comprehensively without using ordering? E, uh, well, um, the uh, first my first uh, reaction to this is I am not sure whether I should answer this, because uh, um, uh, Professor P. P. C. has already given this as a discussion assignment in the first uh, lecture if you remember. This is the one of the first, uh, uh, one of the problems he, he suggested that be discussed. Uh, now, uh, one line answer is yes, because ordering, when you do ordering, certainly that is one way of finding it. But what is the sense of the median? The sense of the median is half the numbers are smaller and half the numbers is greater. So, if you can write that out in a mathematical form, set theoretic uh, or logical form then you have defined your median. To define the median, you do not need to find the median. This, please do not, when you are talking about problem formulation, you yet have not found a way to solve the problem. If you define it as a, in terms of ordering, then you are already going to the solution. You are pre-assuming that it has, the set has to get ordered for its median to be known. But uh, the problem formulation will say that I should be able to express it using set theoretics logical different mathematical expression language as a specification and then derive the solution for that eventually. And as we will uh, show the select algorithm that I skipped uh, in the presentation today, I will talk about that during sorting searching as we will show that median can indeed be found without ordering the numbers. Because all that you need to specify is half the numbers are smaller and half the numbers are greater. So, please try to work on that. For simplification, you can assume that the that the number of numbers is odd, which makes your median unique. You do not have to take care of the specific cases that Professor P. P. C. mentioned, but please try to solve that problem. Any other left? We are at the end of the time almost. These three. Uh, RCID 1172, are you there? Your question was difference between linear recursive algorithm and recursive traversal algorithm. Could you explain the question? Could you explain the question? The question, uh, the, there was a question typed out difference between linear recursive algorithm and recursive traversal algorithm. Can you hear me? Please, please raise your hand if you can hear me. I cannot hear you. Yes, I can see your hand raised. Yes, can, now can you, can you tell me what is the question because this is unclear.
is your mic on or just check if your mic is on okay uh, it seems that uh, there is some problem with the with the voice uh, I, I do not get this question uh, clearly but uh, uh, one simple reaction would be that uh, there is a I cannot understand what is meant by linear recursive algorithm there is recursive algorithm and uh, it may happen to have a linear complexity, but there is no class of algorithms as linear recursive algorithms and uh, a traversal algorithm is a, is a traversal algorithm. So, I presume that you are talking about trees I do not know because traversal also is a very general term. So, um, uh, I do not know if you are but uh, traversal naturally could be recursive as we will see actually actually you, you can try to map this when uh, professor PPC does his sessions tomorrow as we will see that all problems are basically derived from a recursive definition. So, everything will have a recursive definition then certain forms of recursion are easier to translate in terms of uh, linear uh, iterative structure and there is a class of them we call the tail recursion and some are not so easy to transfer. So, those are the different design choices that you make, but otherwise uh, you, you could write uh, write out this question in more detail form we are not being able to understand beyond this. We will go to RCID 1061 the, the question is clear. So, even before connecting to you I will answer that. Uh, the question is uh, we want to know which problems in DAA design and analysis of algorithm generates amortized analysis. Uh, see a problem will not generate analysis uh, amortized analysis uh, typically is uh, done of uh, algorithm strategies. Uh, we will we will talk some bit uh, in while we talk about uh, lower bound problems are analyzed for their inherent complexity and algorithms are analyzed for their efficiency of working and amortized uh, techniques are primarily talked up in terms of algorithmic strategy. So, it is not uh, which problems, but uh, a I can I can say the kind of thumb rule if you if you would like to observe the pattern is where amortization uh, is uh, effective or people look more for it is where you are in your input you have a distribution of certain inputs taking a very large amount of time and certain inputs taking a very small amount of time and you do not know any easy way you do not have a easy way to define the distribution of the inputs. So, then the question is uh, can I do something which naturally mixes up the bad cases with the good cases and uh, give me something which is acceptable in in all possible ways. So, that is where the amortization will will often happen. So, the example of telephone directory we talked of it works because you have a large number of bad cases and a small number of good cases, but it so happens that the small number of good cases are looked up most often and the large number of bad cases are not looked up at all. So, you can mix them up properly and uh, I will certainly also discuss it from that context when we talk about amortization in stacks tomorrow. One one zero seven. Uh, again we will have to it is how can we find out probabilistic case of an algorithm and how to denote it. Uh, uh, you denote it in the in the in a very uh, there are ok. Uh, let me answer it in two parts. The question is how can we find out probabilistic case of an algorithm and how to denote it. One part is I can have a normal algorithm usual algorithm and I can have a probabilistic analysis for that. So, that is basically a generalization of the average case analysis. In the average case analysis I assume that all my inputs are uniformly distributed 
in place of that I may know the distribution, I may know that my input is Poisson distributed or normally distributed and based on that distribution I analyze my algorithm and say what is the complexity. So, there again I will talk about finally, a complexity order n n square something like that. The other case is the probabilistic analysis is more often used for algorithms which are themselves randomized. So, if an algorithm is randomized then I may also say that this complexity holds with a probability of such and such. I may say this algorithm is linear with a probability of 99 percent. So, there are probabilistic number of algorithms which have that kind of a guarantee that if you want a linear uh, this this says that it is linear, but it is linear with 99 percent probability or it is linear with 99 point as many nines you want to put after that percent probability, but it is not 100 percent linear. That means, there exists at least one case when it is not linear. So, there are algorithms of that. So, those uh, probabilistic analysis results hold if your algorithm itself is randomized. So, probabilistic analysis has two sheds. Now, I mean we are not going much much into this because finally, you know in the our overall context is uh, as uh, we mentioned at the beginning is the first level undergraduate course. So, these are certainly in, in, in a in a large uh, space the probabilistic analysis and all that will not be done, but it is important for us to know the whole uh, discovery space together. How to calculate the complexity of matrix chain multiplication and how to find uh, the efficiency? Uh, this will be discussed. So, this will come in terms of the general formulation of the problems. So, only if it does not get discussed then we will answer it otherwise this will be a answer out of the context. How can we calculate complexity of algorithm if algorithm is for microprocessor design using hardware description language. Uh, 1306 how can we calculate the complexity of algorithm is algorithm is for microprocessor design using hardware description language. Uh, this is uh, it is difficult to put a context of this question to this uh, algorithm course, because as you can see uh, you are saying hardware description language right. So, I can understand uh, you have something like Verilog VHDL in mind or maybe system C in mind. Now, as the name suggests it is a hardware description language, it is not an execution language. So, when we talk about HDL for example, uh, you uh, talk about uh, VHDL or uh, say very log in that, then the modules and instantiations are describing your hardware than executing something. So, it is a it is a it is one major part is the architectural part, which it is analysis does not come in the purview of the present course. The other part for example, if you are talking about process uh, in, in Verilog, then it is simple algorithm, procedures are simple algorithm. So, they will they are amenable to all the techniques that we apply here. In fact, uh, if you uh, uh, if you have uh, if you are familiar with system Verilog, the whole of C++ is a part of system Verilog now. So, all the algorithmic strategies go as a part of it. Otherwise, the description part is not a part of uh, at least the current scope of algorithm design course that we are talking of. So, we will skip that. Uh, what are the advantages and application of amortized analysis? I think uh, by now I have answered and we will see examples uh, tomorrow. What is the utility of applying different types of analysis methods for a particular program? Uh, 1266, what is the utility of applying different types of analysis methods? for a particular program. By when you are writing program, uh, we are talking of algorithms right now. So, um, I mean the only difference being we are not specific about when you say program it is a it is a specific implementation. The same algorithm may have multiple programs. So, I am talking about a specific uh, algorithm. It is it is important to know the different uh, uh, when you say analysis methods, if you are meaning the different methods like counting, like uh, asymptotic, like master theorem that we discussed, then obviously there is no meaning because finally you want to find out the asymptotic complexity. So, you apply whichever method 
you can do for that particular algorithm may be multiple methods we are applying different methods to the same algorithm just to be able just to learn but once you have learned then for an algorithm we can use any of the methods which solve but if you talk about in the case of which case uh, where do you do it which case you should analyze then you sh should analyze the different cases because that tells you what input is actually amenable how will you for example quick sort unless you analyze it for the average case you would not be able to see that in spite of being quadratic in the worst case it happens to be indeed the most efficient sorting algorithm which work on traditional strategies which is not randomized and all that. So, it is important to analyze different cases, but certainly methods is for our learning. How to analyze memory? Yeah, that is that is very very interesting and I am sure uh, Professor P. P. C. in the tomorrow's part has one uh, very interesting insight into into analyzing memory, and uh, mm, okay, let me hold that. Um, um, let me hold that temptation. Let me not release that because that that's a very interesting uh, interesting uh, discussion that he does. You may have seen this in the video. If you have seen the video carefully, this question is answered in the video already. Is a basic question of what is fundamentally different between the analysis of time and the analysis of space there is something fundamentally different ask yourself that or you can look up and see that video otherwise let us wait for ppc to answer that because he, he does that in a very nice way so i will skip that hmm? okay okay i think we will uh, okay uh, uh, okay, uh, that uh, brings us uh, almost uh, to the end of uh, all distinct questions we had on this part. Uh, I have tried to give some of the answers, some will get covered uh, significantly tomorrow because tomorrow is the main day for the fundamentals of algorithms. And uh, um, uh, now it is time for the respective uh, coordinators to hold the discussion in the respecting centers. The discussion points we have tried to give some outline on uh, the points for discussion. The discussion points have already been mailed to the coordinators, right? So, please uh, follow those discussions. It has been uploaded on Moodle as well as uh, mailed to the coordinators. So, coordinators, please note that and uh, try to cover these discussion points in the next uh, hour and a half that you that you spend. And uh, make sure that you uh, send us a one page summary of the discussion at the end of the day and upload it. They have, they may start discussing it on Moodle. And the, if we have questions uh, coming out of those discussions, then you please uh, put that in the Moodle, so that we can uh, take it up tomorrow. Okay. With that, I will uh, sign off for today. See you tomorrow in the morning. Bye.